one of the things we did was to think about the internal energy E as a function of, what did we think of it? We thought of it as a function of T and V, right? We said, this is not nat these are not natural variables, but this is still, you can still write down this function. And that led us to writing DE as partial E by partial T at constant V at DT plus partial E by partial V at constant T dV. And we said, this is CV. This was the definition of CV multiplied by DT plus this we called the internal pressure pi t multiplied by dv. It was easy to show that pi t is equal to zero for ideal gas. Later, we will be seeing the value that pi t takes for other things. And notice pi t is different from the thermodynamic pressure we introduced earlier because the thermodynamic pressure was minus E. First of all, there was a minus sign, minus partially by partial V at constant Sn, right? The thermodynamic pressure was defined in the space of natural variables, but not the internal pressure. So let's put this thing to use. Let's use this to look at adiabatic reversible expansion. By expansion, I mean compression also. It's reversible. It could go in either direction of an ideal gas. And let's try to describe what we want to do is to think about, for example, how would how would this look in, let's say, volume temperature space. So we are talking about expansion, right? So we started from here and we go to some other point here. What will be the curve defining this process, right? We want to calculate this for an ideal gas. And through this, one can imagine so many other problems. You will have some underwater gas, you will have some real gas for which you measured the equation of state through some experiment and you want to study how it will behave. And you can see why this would be useful, right? If you want to think about how, I don't know, a rocket would behave at low temperatures, you know, you know how exactly the volume of the thing, of, uh, of the gas being used inside the rocket would, uh, 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 would, uh, uh, change. So in order to calculate this, let's do this for an ideal gas. So what, what should we start with? What equation do you think we should start with in order to calculate this curve? It's an ideal gas. You all know PV is equal to NRT, right? That's not going to do everything. Let's start with the first law of thermodynamics, right? Because we also know it's adiabatic. So first law of thermodynamics says du is equal to delta Q minus P external dv. What can we say here about delta Q? Why? It's adiabatic. What can we say about P external? It's minus P because it's reversible, right? So it's in equilibrium. So du is equal to minus P dv. Let's call this as the equation number one. It's an ideal gas. Or so, and I keep changing U and E. I mean, I will try to write E. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, it's, 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 not possible. I, I will keep using U and E interchangeably. I mean, I can't help it. I'm sorry. So <clears throat> it doesn't really matter much, I think, at this point. So what else can we say about du? Looking at this equation where I wrote U as E for an ideal gas. Is CV. is CV dt, right? So that's equation number two. Let's the du is the same in both one and two. So let's write them together. So that becomes CV dt is equal to minus P dv. If we assume that the heat capacity is constant as a function of temperature, which as I told you last time is not true. The heat capacity becomes constant as a function of temperature only at very, very large temperature. Otherwise it changes. So maybe you have also measured the function, right? Maybe you know CV as a function of T, the math will just become a bit harder, but the basic idea is the same, right? So if we assume that CV is constant as a function of temperature, then we can do the integral. We can take it from Ti to Tf, and we can take this one from Vi to Vf. Here, the pressure we cannot take out, right? The pressure is definitely going to change. But now we assume it's an ideal gas, right? We have assumed already. So pressure is equal to nRT by V. Therefore, CV, and I did something stupid here. 
Yeah, I rushed too soon, sorry. I have to be a bit careful. Sorry about that. I hear loud, angry scratches. So let's equate them. So PDV is equal to minus CV DT, right? Now let's write P as NRT by V. So NRT DV by V is equal to minus CV DT or NR DV by V is equal to minus CV DT by T. And here we assume that CV is constant as a function of temperature. If it was a known function that you had measured from experiment, the math would, you could still do the integration. Nothing would really become complicated, just a bit of algebra. So we do this integral. We are going from VI to VF. And here we are going from TI to TF, right? So what does this give us? This gives us NR ln VF by VI is equal to minus CV ln TF by TI, right? Let's call CV by NR. Let's give it a name. Let's call it C, the small letter C, not to be confused with the speed of light, okay? So what does that give us? So CV by NR, so that means ln VF by VI is equal to minus C ln TF by TI, right? Therefore, ln, you can bring this minus C to the power of this thing over here, right? And then you can remove the ln entirely. Therefore, VI TI to the power C is equal to VF TF to the power C. This is the equation for adiabatic reversible expansion of an ideal gas, right? And this basic formula you would be able to use for many, many things, except you will run into problem here, right? This is where you will have to be careful. If it's not an ideal gas, if it's, an, if it's not an ideal gas, this will still be true for adiabatic expansion, right? Because dQ is zero. This one, however, is true only for ideal gas. And this is where you need to be very careful. You can still do it, but you will have to go and think about the internal pressure. You will have to calculate the value. So it will become harder. So this is like a classic mistake happens when solving these problems. Any questions about this? Yeah, go ahead. Where do you go from, I'm just confused about the last one. Where do you go from LNTR? Oh, good, no problem. So you see this minus C over here, right? Mm -hmm. Now let me do a magic trick. I will do this and make it to the power minus C. Because X ln Y is equal to ln of Y to the power X, right? So that's what I did. And then I can remove this ln and ln, right? So therefore VF by VI is equal to TF by TI to the power minus C. Okay. Any other questions? You said that this would hold only for, I didn't get that last one. Well, because this equation two holds only for ideal gas. Okay. Okay. So you're saying for other gases, it won't be second. Yeah, other gases, you'll have to sit and figure it out. Yeah, but it's also only for reversible process. It's only for reversible. Yeah, if it's not reversible, it, you are also screwed. If it's not reversible, then you're really screwed. If it's not ideal gas, you can still work with it. The math will be harder. Any more questions? All right, this is the moment you are all waiting for. Let's do a pop quiz. Close your notes. Notes have to be closed. We have like two, three minutes. Just pass the sheet down. It will be graded only for participation. So please try it. It's really as a feedback to you. If you're feeling rusty about any of this, that means. And if you have extra sheets, you can give them. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone who doesn't have a sheet? Okay. The five problems, please write your name clearly at the top. And you have like two, three minutes. 
it will become obvious. If you're done, just come and drop your sheet over here. You can make it like a Hunger Games. If half the people have dropped their sheet, then your time is over. So now you might think, should I go and leave my sheet? No, it's okay. You have like two minutes. No notes, please. I mean, the whole point is to... Yeah, don't look at your notes. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right, and everything is zero. Right? And it's like right. Okay, one minute left. Minus 30 seconds left. Come on, hurry up, everyone. Now, do you feel like odd? I guess. Okay, thanks. up. So you won't be graded. I'm telling you the answers right now. You have, you have full grades if you just submit that. Sorry. You can still get points if you're brave enough to answer it with me on the spot. Okay. You up for that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want a coffee or like you know, like Red Bull or something to get charged? Which problem do you want to answer first? So let's start with the first part. What is the change in heat? Heat is a path function. Change in Q at constant pressure is equal to change of a state function. Which state function? Enthalpy. The symbol? H. H. Uh, what about the second one? At constant, uh, sorry, so that was constant pressure. How about constant volume? It's the internal energy. Internal energy. Perfect. Good. You, you get points. Who wants to answer the second one? Uh, do I get partial ones? Huh? Do I get partial ones? Well, you get full. He does it. And you were in class, so that's okay. Okay, thank you. Good. Okay. So, how about the second one? Who wants to take a shot? Go ahead. You, yeah. What's your name? 
Yeah, go ahead. Uh, let's change the test. Let's see what is the answer. Ds, right? So Sb plus Sc minus Sa, right? So I'll just write down. Or here. And this will be in the notes. So constant volume is de. I'll write that in red actually. Constant pressure is dh. Sc plus Sb minus Sa. Okay, not the other way. Is ds is final minus initial. How about the third one? Who wants to answer? I mean, I just mentioned it on the last page. Yeah, so. And this one is S, comma N, good. How about fourth one? Less than or more than? It's less than equal. Are you sure? I don't know. I, like, I tried to put in value of lambda. I was getting it to equal. Both it's less than equal to. It's, you shouldn't have to think that hard. It's basically saying that if you have two things with internal constraints and you remove the constraints and you let them mix, the entropy will go up, right? That's the whole idea. This is when the system is partitioned into one minus lambda and lambda, right? And you're looking at them independently. That's the physics over here, right? And if you mix them and that internal constraint has gone away, the entropy. And is this concavity or con convexity? It's concavity. Good. So again, if you participated, you get full points. If you got more than, if you got even a single one wrong, wake up. If you got two wrongs, really wake up. If you got three wrong, not good news. Okay, there'll be at least a couple more pop quizzes through the course of the semester. So, and don't try his strategy next time, okay? Like just come late and answer one question and get full points. I mean, yeah, I won't, this won't happen next time. Yeah, sure. I, that's why I gave it on second page, you know, not early on. Okay, so what did we do today? We did a pop quiz. Before that, we looked at the equation in the volume temperature space for an ideal gas. And I, and I will give you homework problems where you will see that this can actually become complicated for other equations of state for the simple reason that you don't have the convenience of du is equal to cv dt. Later, we will see that pi t has, is the value minus a n square by v square. Actually, you don't even have to go later. If you remember, you did this in the midterm, right? In the midterm, I gave you the equation for internal energy of a van der Waals gas, remember? If, and that internal energy for a van der Waals gas was three n by two RT minus something. If you differentiate that, you can actually see what will happen. The question is, how do you get that equation for internal energy of a van der Waals gas, right? So we'll see that. So this is fine. And uh, now what I'm going to do next is to look at something a bit more carefully, which we have mentioned. What did we mention? We mentioned many things. One of the things we mentioned is we mentioned that if a process is taking heat from a reservoir at some temperature T hot and transferring that heat into a cold sink at temperature Tc. And in the process, you are getting some work out of this. Let's say this work is W. Let's say you are getting QH over here. And let's say you're transferring QC over here, okay? Actually, let me not write down QH and QC at this point because later the signs will become confusing. Let's not, let's keep the symbol W over here. So you have a process which is sucking out heat from a hot source and giving it to a cold sink, right? Is, do you know of a real world example of something that does this? Huh? A heater, right? It's a heater, right? So we know that we proved for a specific case, but I told you Callan had a general proof that this work done will be maximum if the process is carried out reversibly, right? We showed it. Remember, we, we wrote down things like, what was the, we wrote down things like, 
delta W irreversible will always be smaller than equal to delta W reversible, right? And uh, remember how we proved this? We had a piston and a gas and we gradually expanded it versus we just expanded it, right? And we showed that in the second case, the area under the curve was, you missed out on a pop quiz, okay? Oh, oops. So, well, it's too late now. You can still redeem the points, you know, but you can still, so if you're going to be late for any reason, just, just let me know, okay, I'm not inhuman, but, uh, or if you're going to miss, you know, if you want to join on Zoom, it's all the options are for you. It's just like, it's not a retrospective policy. You have to let me know in advance. So when, when I started giving pop quizzes in the undergrad thermo, I teach, all my colleagues told me that your ratings are going to tank. It did not happen that way. The students actually like it, believe it or not. So hopefully you will also like it but because I think it's a good way to just, just, you know, be real about it, right? If you're not gonna understand, it gives you real feedback. I mean, I'm not, yes, I'm gonna look at it and judge you. No, just kidding, it's fine. So we know that Delta W irreversible is less than equal to Delta W reversible, right? The maximum work you can get out of a process is if you carry it out reversibly. So we can think about uh, efficiency, right? We can introduce introduce something known, something we will call as thermodynamic efficiency. The general symbol for these things is eta, ETA, eta. And we can call this eta as the heat that you sucked out of the hot source. So it's going to be the work that you were able to get out divided by the heat you sucked out. Eta cannot be more than one that would solve the energy crisis in the world, right? You suck some energy out of the solar sun and you were able to produce more energy out of it. That would be, that would be something that Alex would be very proud of because it would probably violate the second law of thermodynamics, right? It's not going to happen. So we know eta is going to be less than or equal to one. We know eta, we have two modulus over there. So it's going to be more than or equal to zero, right? So we know that eta is maximized or I have said that eta is maximized when process is carried reversibly. The question is, what is the maximum value of eta? Can you really reach eta equal to one? Yeah, so there was a, I think French thermodynamic expert by the name of Sadi Carnot, who came up with Carnot's theorem, or it's named after him. Carnot's theorem makes a very interesting result that the maximum efficiency is actually one minus Tc by Th. This is kind of profound if you think about it. It's earlier we said that the maximum efficiency or the maximum work done is if the process is reversible. This is actually giving you a number about it, right? This is, this is really profound. You, you have an up, actual upper bound and you're not going to exceed that come what may. So, Car so this is what we are going to prove next, which is Carnot's theorem, how to do that. In order to do that, we are going to look at a specific thermodynamic process known as Carnot's cycle. Okay, I will do it on the next page. So if you were able to keep your cold, so this is our hot source and this is our cold sink. If you were able to keep your cold sink at zero Kelvin, then you could reach 100% efficiency or eta is equal to one, right? But then there would be some work that would be going into just maintaining it at that low temperature. So let's try to prove this. In order to prove this, we will start with a Carnot cycle. The Carnot cycle looks as follows. Let me write down page numbers one, two, three and four. So let's look at the Carnot cycle. It's, it's represented in a pressure volume space here, but you can represent it at any space. And I can guarantee you there will be homework problems, future midterm problems, exam problems, but I will be asking you to do that. I will give you a process in a certain space in pressure volume say, space. And I will ask you to think, how will it look in entropy temperature space? or some other space, you know, and you will have to work through it. 
So here it looks as follows. You start at a certain point A. From A, you go to a B. From B, you go to a C, and I will describe exactly what they are. And from C, you go to a D, and from D, you come back to an A. Okay, so this, these are, there are four steps in it. Every step is reversible, okay? So, and we will call this as step number one, step number two, step number three, step number four. Step number one is isothermal reversible expansion, okay? You can see the volume has increased as we went from A to B at T is equal to TH. So what is step number one doing? It's in contact with your hot source and it is letting the gas to expand at constant temperature, okay? Step number two is adiabatic reversible also expansion, but now the temperature is going to change. The temperature will go down as you expand adiabatically and you can work through this and see how it is. And, and by the way, note that I'm not assuming ideal gas here at all, okay? This could be any material. There is no assume. We have not assumed ideal behavior. In fact, Carnot's theorem is not for ideal gases, it's for absolutely any material that you can think of, okay? Adiabatic reversible expansion, expansion from T is equal to TH to T is equal to TC. Step number, yeah, go ahead. Um, since we're not talking about ideal gases, it's always the case that uh, adiabatic expansion is steeper than isothermal expansion. That's a good question. I think you could imagine some free cases where it's not the true. Yeah, this is a good question. For either guys, it's true. In general, is it true or not? I have to think. It's a good problem, I'll think. And if I cannot solve it, I'll give it as a bonus problem. So third is again, isothermal. So what Omar asked is that this adiabatic thing over here is steeper than the isothermal thing over here. For, it, for ideal gas, it's easy to show. I think you did it in the midterm, right? Why that is the case. But for a non-ideal gas, for a Van der Waals gas also, you can show it. Is it going to be always true in general? I don't know, I have to think. Isothermal reversible contraction at T is equal to TC. And four, is adiabatic reversible contraction at T is equal to, from, uh, and as, as you do this, the temperature again goes back from TC to TH. Okay, so four steps. The first one, step number, Step number one and step number three are isothermal. They are happening at respectively temperature TH and TC. While step number two and step number four are adiabats, okay? That's the Carnot cycle. When people started doing thermodynamics, they were very interested in cycles of all sorts. It's any, does anyone here have an undergrad in some sort of engineering? So I had my undergrad in old school subject known as metallurgical engineering or there are subjects like mechanical engineering there they explored your head with thermodynamic cycles. This Carnot cycle, Otto cycle, diesel cycle, this cycle, that cycle. And people actually used to make these cycles and they, because they were interested in designing steam engines, right? That was the whole idea. You were expanding steam, trying to do some work for it, giving it back, expanding it again. And they were obsessed with how fast things could run for, for natural reasons, you know? So, that's why they were thinking of these things. But now we don't go around making such cycles, but they still play a very useful role in our understanding of thermodynamics. So, um, yeah. Why do we, so we are defining those processes to be isothermal. Yeah. So we're setting that from. Yeah. Because it's our world. It's like, have you seen the show called Westworld? You haven't seen Westworld. 
has anyone seen here westward? No one has seen westward. No one. Can that be a bonus problem? No, that? it's terrible. Westward is where you create these fake worlds and people go in there and then they have no idea whether it's fake or real and they get very confused. It's a very good show. Okay, good. So you guys are working too hard you need to catch up on your TV. So in the first stage, let's say the system gains heat QH. In the second stage, it's adiabatic. So what will be the heat transfer? Zero, right? Fourth stage is also adiabatic. So the heat transfer is zero. So first stage and third stage, there will be some heat transfer. In the third stage, let's say it gains heat QC, but it actually contracted. So QC is going to be negative, right? So I'm just using semantics here. So QH is positive and QC is negative, okay? Two and four, no heat exchanged because it's adiabatic. So what is going to be the change in entropy for the full four stages, delta S1 plus delta S2 plus delta S3 plus delta S4. What can we say about that? No, no, zero, it's a state function. It's a state function, that's it. You are correct, it would be less than equal to something if you went to some other state. But if you came back, then that doesn't matter. You know. So that is equal to zero. Out of these, what can we say about delta S2? Adiabatic process. Yeah. Are you sure? It's a reversible adiabatic process. That's why it's zero, right? So just, yeah, it is zero, you're correct. But since it is a adiabatic reversible process, let me just remind you that ds is equal to delta Q reversible by T. If it was adiabatic, but not reversible, then you would be screwed. You won't be able to say whether it's zero or not, right? Since it's adiabatic reversible. So hopefully you're starting to get a flavor of thermodynamics. It's very easy. It's like a few games, but I don't know. It's like playing chess. Just because the rules are very few, you don't become Gary Kasparov, right? It's really, really hard. And you have to figure out how to use the rules. So, and everything that you write, every word that you say, means something. Is it adiabatic or not? Is it reversible or not? You, know, you have to use everything very, very carefully. And if in doubt, start with the first law of thermodynamics and your Callan's postulate and everything will keep starting following from there. So delta S3 is equal to, well, not delta S3, delta S4, I will write down over here. So Delta S2 is equal to delta S4 is equal to zero because reversible adiabatic process. Both things are important. If either of them was not true, it would not be the case. You would have delta S2, delta S4, some positive value or negative value, depends on what's going on. So this we can say is true for sure. So let's go to the next page. I'll hold here just for a moment. <coughs> Now let's think about delta S1. Let me draw the process once again so you don't have to go back and look at it. So it's in PV space. You have something that goes like this, something that goes like this, something that goes like this, something that goes like this. And notice that even though I drew it steeper, I'm not really using that fact in any way, right? So this is, we can check. So, yeah, but the overall answer might be the same. <laughs> yeah, overall answer still might be the same. So if work is negative, I think you're already reaching a contradiction. You would be able to get work out of, you would be able to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, I've, I've, you will get an extra problem, don't worry. So this is step number one at TH. This is step number three at TC. This is step number four, adiabat. And this is uh, not four, that's step number two, adiabat. And this is step number four, adiabat, okay? And everything is reversible and we have not assumed ideal gas. However, we have assumed reversible. So what can, and we said that delta S total is equal to delta S one 
plus delta S3 because delta S2 and delta S4 are zero because it's reversible adiabat. Okay, everything is reversible. So what can we say about delta S1? How do we calculate it? Okay, so let's start with the formula. It's a reversible process, right? So it will be integral delta Q reversible by temperature. And we know that the temperature is TH, it's constant, right? So TH comes out, one over TH delta Q reversible. And I already told you that in the first process, we suck in heat equal to QH, right? So this is equal to QH by TH, okay? Similarly, delta S3, same idea, and we don't have to worry about minus signs because of the way we have written it, is going to give you QC by TC, okay? So we have, let me number my equations. We got to equation number two, I think. These were just problems. So let's call this equation number three, that delta S total is equal to zero. So if we use these two, that delta S1 is equal to QH by TH and delta S3 is equal to QC by TC, therefore equation number three implies that QH by TH plus QC by TC is equal to zero, okay? Therefore, modulus of QC by QH is equal to TC by TH, right? So we are almost there. We haven't quite proved the efficiency for a Carnot cycle, but we are almost there. So now let's think about the efficiency. Let's call this equation number four. The thermodynamic efficiency is work performed by heat absorbed from source. Okay, so what is the work performed? That is something W. And what is the heat performed, uh, absorbed from source? That is some QH. So what we have is a relation for QC by QH. We don't quite know what is W. However, W is going to be nothing but QH minus QC, right? Because overall the system is insulated. The change in internal energy overall is zero, right? So if you took in over here, heat QH and gave out heat QC, then the remainder has to be W, right? It's where can it go? The full thing is isolated. The full thing is thermally isolated, okay? Does that make sense that W is equal to QH minus QC? So this is equation number five. This is equation number six. So five plus six imply eta is equal to QH minus QC by QH. That is equal to one minus modulus of QC by modulus of QH. And we just showed that modulus of QC by QH is equal to TC by TH or eta is equal to one minus TC by TH. So we have just proven, proved that the efficiency of a Carnot cycle operating reversibly between temperature TH and temperature TC is one minus TC by TH. We have not proved that there you cannot construct some other cycle which will beat this efficiency. That could be possible, right? So we are not quite there yet. We have not shown that the maximum efficiency for any possible thermodynamic cycle or reversible process is TC, one minus TC by TH. We have proved it only for Carnot cycle. Any questions about this? Yeah, go ahead. How do you go from work over QH to QH first? Yeah, so does this make sense, Sophia? You took in 100 kilojoule of energy from the food that you consumed and you ran spending and, and, and you gave out 80 kilojoule of energy, dissipation, sweat or whatever. So the remaining 20 kilojoule is the balance that you were able to use as work, right? Because overall you are insulated. 
That's the whole idea over here. That's why W is equal to QH minus QC. If W is equal to QH minus QC, and if you agree with this formula for the efficiency, that efficiency is work divided by heat, then I put this over here, QH minus QC. Okay, let, let me write it on once again. So yeah, and if anything is not clear, please, please ask a question. There's no reason to just like, let me go away at the efficiency of a Carnot cycle because I cannot be any more efficient. So we know eta is equal to delta W divided by delta QH, right? Which is the work you get out divided by heat you absorbed. At the same time, W is equal to QH minus QC is equal to heat you absorbed minus heat you lost to surroundings, right? That is gone. That is like an egg breaking. It's not going to reform. It's lost. It's become more entropic. It's gone away. So now, therefore, eta is equal to, you put this thing in the numerator, QH minus QC divided by QH is equal to one minus QC by QH. Okay? Is it better, Sophia? Okay, good. So the next part is a bit trippy. So what have we done so far? We have proved that a Carnot cycle, which is reversible isothermal adiabat, isothermal adiabat has efficiency one minus Tc by Th. Does not depend what material you are using. Ideal gas, any gas, that's the efficiency. Yeah. Just a question. In this work, the definition for efficiency, would it not make more sense to define it as heat released from the, uh, like, why are we defining it for the source and not the, it's defined for the process, but wouldn't it be more efficient if you're not releasing, if all the heat you're absorbing is all the heat you're converting to? Why are we talking about heat absorbed from the source? Rather How would you like to define it? Like, I'm just saying, if you define it as- Tell me, let's w define by, a eta Vedant. W by QC. W by QC. That's like saying. I mean, I don't know if I define it that way. All I'm saying is that if I'm doing, <coughs> it's a very efficient process, then all the heat I'm absorbed, I'm, I'm converting. Well, then eta would become infinite, right? It's only changing a scale. In this case, so eta Vedant is going to be, that's the only difference. Because now if QC is zero, you're not dissipating any heat, then the denominator becomes zero. If physics is the same. Because W, QH, and QC are connected, right? So you could define it this way. There is no problem. But it's zero, one is a nicer range instead yeah. of zero infinity. Like my, my efficiency is 5,444. Uh, what does that mean? But if I say my efficiency is 0.544, you know it means 54%, right? So you, it's better to have bounded things. So therefore, we can conclude that eta Vedanta is not a very good idea, <laughs> okay? So if you have just proved that a Carnot cycle has efficiency one minus TH, TC by TH, this is a very special type of reversible cycle. Now we want to prove it's not just Carnot process, it's any process that if operating reversibly cannot exceed this efficiency, and then our Carnot's theorem will be complete, right? So in order to do that, we will use something that is known as math as proof by contradiction. Okay, that's why I said it's going to be just a bit trippy. Does anyone know in math what is the like the most classic example of proof by contradiction? It's proving that square root of two is a rational number, right? You write down square root by two is equal to p by q, then that gives you two is equal to p square by q square, p square is equal to two q square, and then you can show that it's a contradiction, right? Or another one is, there are finite number of primes. You can prove that also by contradiction. If there is a finite number of primes, well, you multiply them all together and add one. Well, that's a prime too. That's a proof by contradiction, okay? So we will do this by proof by contradiction and it's, it's quite simple as long as you're 
okay with this abstract concept of proving by contradiction. So let's say, let's suppose it is possible to have two engines with different efficiencies efficiencies any chemical okay it could be uh, ideal gas and some other material running reversibly so we have not yet gone to irreversible things we have not, and carnot's theorem has nothing to do with irreversible thing it is just quantifying the maximum reversible efficiency you can have running reversibly between some hot source TH and some cold sink TC, okay? Let's say it's engine A and engine B. And let's say that eta of engine A is more efficient. Engine A is more efficient than engine B. So eta A is more than equal to eta B. What is the definition of eta? Remember, we cannot use TC by TH here. Why can't we use it? Huh? Yeah, we are not talking about Carnot. Exactly, you're correct. We are not talking about Carnot, right? We are talking about any process. So we cannot just jump in and write TC by TH because then there will be a problem. That's what we are trying to prove. You're absolutely correct. Okay, you get pop quiz points. If you participate, you get points. I mean, the whole idea is to encourage you to participate, right? I mean, so, so what can we write about data? WA, the work that engine A gets out and the heat that engine A absorbs is more than the work that engine B gets out divided by heat that engine B absorbs, okay? Let's, for the sake of argument, let's assume that, yeah, we will do the assumption in the next line. Let's, let's make one more change here. Let's, we can write down W in terms of QH and QC, right? This is the same argument that we went through with Sophia, that W is equal to QH minus QC, right? So let's do that over here for both of them. So WA, is going to be QHA minus QCA and WB is going to be QHB minus QCB, right? Heat absorbed minus heat given out, okay? So let's... Equation six, where are we? We are at equation, let's call this as equation seven, and let's call this together as equation eight. So put eight in seven. What do we get? We get one minus QCA by QHA is more than one minus QCB by Q. H B. Okay. <clears throat> because when we put this, when we put this thing in the numerator over here, the denominator has QAH, right? So that becomes one and you have a ratio and you have a difference. Now we will assume keep QCA is equal to QCB. This is just an assumption. You could have done the same thing by assuming that QHA is equal to QHB, right? You want to, if you don't do this assumption, then you're kind of stuck. You will see why the assumption matters, okay? There is, there is nothing wrong with the assumption. It's just what it is. So if we, so what we are saying here is that both of these processes are taking in some heat from a hot source, giving out some heat to a cold sink, and they are doing some work. And we want to compare them when one is more efficient than the other. And we are saying that both of them are dissipating the same amount of heat. They are giving out the same amount of heat. So this is 
equation number nine. Therefore, equation number nine implies, one moment. The one and one already cancel, right? And you can bring this thing to the right-hand side. Let, let me write it down in detail. So if you cancel one, one and one, that becomes minus QCA by QHA is more than minus QCB by QHB. And we have just said that the numerator is the same. QCA is the same as QCB, right? Therefore, that's the setup of the problem. I'm trying to compare two engines which are working with different efficiencies and both of them are dissipating the same amount of heat. So the simple argument that you're going to get here is that one of them must be absorbing lower heat, right? right? It's like one of them is uh, Eliud Kipchoge, you know, and he can run he, he sweats the same amount, but just he has to eat very little, right? That's the whole point. You could do the other thing. You could say both of them are consuming the same amount of heat, but when the dissipated amount will be different. So this thing, QCA and QCB will cancel because we just set them to be the same. Therefore, modulus of QHA is going to be more than modulus of QHB. This is a lot of algebra, but we have proven something quite simple. We have said you have two engines operating one is more efficient than the other one. This both dissipate the same amount of heat. So what does it tell about the amount of heat that you must have absorbed, okay? Now we are going to do the really trippy part. We are going to run the engine B in the opposite direction, okay? So let me draw something which would make this all clear. So we had a hot source. Let's say it's the same hot source, right? Because we have temperature TH and it's the same cold sink which had temperature TC. So this was my hot source at temperature TH and this was my cold sink at temperature TC. So I had this engine A which was taking heat QHA and doing some work WA, right? And it was giving out some heat QCA. And we have this engine B. Which was taking heat QHB giving out heat QCB. And what I'm going to do now is to remove this A and B because we just assumed that the heat that is being given out to the cold sink is the same, right? So there is no point in writing A and B. And this was doing some work W. So what I want you to do now is to think about operating the engine B reversibly. What will that mean? Instead of getting work out of it, you are now going to transfer heat from the cold sink and give it back to the hot source. In order to do this, you won't be able to get work out of it, right? You will have to do work on it, on it, right? So, and this was WB. So I will draw it in the same figure. I will draw it in a separate color. So now we have B, which is taking heat out of the amount QC, giving heat back to the hot source of amount QHB, and that's why I'm using modulus, so I don't have to worry about signs here. And you are doing some work W in or WB in order to do this, okay? It's, it's, it's simple, but it's a bit different. So you have, you have to really stick with me on this one. What can we say about WA relative to WB? Engine A is more efficient. So which one is going to be higher? 
WA, right? You are going to get more work out of engine A than out of engine B, right? So if now you want to ignore this part in the middle and think about process A acting in the forward direction and process B acting in the backward direction, let's make a new figure for the same thing. Once again, we have a hot source. So this is equivalent to, we have a hot source at TH. And we have a cold sink at TC. Engine A is running exactly as we first said, it is running in the forward direction. It is giving, it is allowing you to produce work WA and it is taking heat QHA. I will get to the cold sink in a bit. And engine W is taking some work WB and giving back heat QHB. If I look at both of them together, what is the total amount of heat you gave or took from the cold sink? Zero, because I kept this to be the same as this, right? So if one of them is operating forward and one of them is operating backward, this is zero. It's as if the cold sink does not exist. So that's the first trippy part, okay? So you can ignore the cold sink altogether. Now you can do one more thing. So I'm going to erase the cold sink because it's not there. It doesn't matter, right? It just doesn't matter. It just went away. But we also know that WB is smaller than WA, right? So what we can do is to think about both of these two things together that you take heat, that you take work W B out of W A and overall you are getting W A minus W B work, right? Because A was producing a lot of work. You give it some of it to B to drive the engine B and you know, because engine B leads less work than A is producing. So the balance is W A minus W B. Finally, this is what it looks like. This looks like as if you have a hot source at some temperature TH, and you have a process that is taking net heat QHA minus QHB, right? You have to account for the fact that you gave back some heat and it is doing some work equal to WA minus WB. And this is a contradiction of our favorite postulate. Why is this a contradiction of our favorite postulate? Huh? You have to be careful. That's not what the postulate says, right? That's, that's what I'm saying. Why is it? You're absolutely correct. That what Kinjal said that the, all you're doing is like 100% efficiency, right? You took some heat and converted everything into work. Why is this a violation of Callan's postulate, second postulate? It's reversible. That's your hint. Uh, QHA is greater, right? Yeah. You have a positive change in entropy for a reversible process. That's not true, right? You have positive delta S for reversible change. And that's not good. That's a violation of our postulate or Kellen's postulate. Therefore, what have we just shown? And one of these engines could now be a Kalen, uh, could be a Carnot cycle, right? So if you had an engine which had a higher efficiency than Carnot cycle, you would run the weaker efficiency engine in the opposite direction and you would be able to violate second law. Okay, so that's the proof. It's kind of complicated, but not really. If you go through it, I really hope the video was recorded today because it might help you understand it better. So we have just shown through contradiction that the maximum possible efficiency for a thermodynamic process is one minus TC by TH for any material, any process, as long as it is reversible. That does not make sense because if it's irreversible, the efficiency is going to be lower anyway, right? So we have just shown that the, if you're taking heat out of a cold, of a hot source at TH and giving it to cold sink at TC, 
your efficiency cannot be more than TC by TH. So this, this, you can see why this is profound, right? Imagine a solar cell, which is taking heat from the sun and giving some heat out at room temperature. You already know what is the efficiency that maximum efficiency can, solar cell can reach. You have a battery, you know exactly what you're going to reach, right? Because we are, energy crisis is perhaps one of the biggest crises currently faced by the world. And this tells you, you can do better, but this is the upper bound. You cannot go above than that, you know? So that, that's why it's so profound. Any questions? Could you just say what you're saying about entropy? Yeah, so what we were able to prove here is that when you take, we just showed a condition where a, a setup where you are taking heat, a positive amount of heat, QHA minus QHB out of a hot source, right? And getting some work out of it. So what is the delta S for this process? Is it positive or negative? It's positive, right? Because it's a reversible process. So the delta, and it's isothermal. So the delta S for this process is going to be QHA minus QHB divided by TH, which is more than zero, right? But I started by saying that the whole thing is reversible. So how can the delta S be zero? That's the contradiction. It's good that you asked because it's, it's, it's kind of subtle. And it's easy to make arguments which are correct, but it's not exactly what the postulate said, right? So we have to be careful in thermodynamics. We can end up using as an argument what we are trying to prove. You know, that's 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 so that's why it is not possible. Any more questions? Okay, it's 10 minutes left. I'm going to stop today because it was a bit complicated. Please go through the notes, please look at the video if it is not clear. This is something which is covered even in undergrad PKM textbooks. I covered it in my 481 class, and which does not mean that it's easy. It means it's even more harder, even harder there for a lot of students. It's, it's a bit complicated, but the whole thing is just shown. I will write down the final result of all this. The final conclusion is therefore maximum efficiency, efficiency for a process that takes heat from TH and dissipates some heat to TC where TC is lower than TH is one minus TC by TH. Any material reversible or irreversible and any process. And this is known as Carnot's theorem. This is effectively equivalent to Callan's postulate, right? We derive, we derive this using Callan's postulate. You, this has the same information. This is how thermodynamics started, yeah? I'm not sure that we derived like, that the maximum efficiency is uh, with Carnot engines, like I feel like what we did is that we proved that the maximum efficiency is for a reversible engine between these two reservoirs. Sure, we showed that, very good point. We showed that if you have two reversible engines acting with different efficiencies, you could invert them and have a contradiction. Yes, yeah, so right? if they're reversible, they have to have Yeah, and at the same time, I showed, and there is one particular reversible engine which has an efficiency one minus TC by TH. Hence but, proved. But we haven't shown that it's the maximum, right? There is a contradiction. If A, if- no, because if we go back, like W, uh, like the engine A and engine B. Yeah. Right, the contradiction arises if we assume, like the contradiction just is lifted if we say, yeah, B is not- So, so what we have done here is to, okay, tell me if you agree with this. We showed that all reversible processes have same efficiency. Do you agree with that? Yeah. And earlier we already showed. Between the same two Yeah, and earlier we already showed that Carnot cycle is one reversible process. And my handwriting is really like an yeah. elephant farting, sorry. Mm -hmm. Is one reversible process with efficiency eta is equal to one minus Tc by Th. Yeah. That's why it's complete. 
Yeah, but we haven't said it's the maximum. It's the only one because all reversible processes must have the same efficiency. Okay. I told you it's trippy. And then on top of that, I'm telling you it's more than not even reversible because we already showed that irreversible processes are going to have lower efficiency. Okay. That's why it generalizes. It's like, yeah, I mean, I could keep coming up with poetic analogies, but you know, it's amazing how it generalizes. Okay, good. So next time we will start with free energies. I already told you a little bit about spontaneity. That's where we will start from next time. And uh, we are almost at Logenda Transforms. The next homework will be out probably next Tuesday. I will do another office hour after that. And uh, yeah.